blessing is on this uh, beautiful night of the full moon. Not much wind or cloud in the sky, so it's very still, quiet outside, so very suitable for sitting, walking meditation. It's also a Tuesday night, so we have a few questions to answer. First, greetings Ajahn. Is it true that if we comment on someone's appearance practicing the path, e.g. a well-practiced bhikkhu such as Lumpoliam, then we might get born into the same thing that we comment on. E.g. if someone thinks he walks like a gangster, a leading gangster, etc. That's the trouble of the uncontrolled mind, isn't it? We start to imagine all kinds of things just by looking at someone or hearing a sound. All these different memories and perceptions come flooding in and lead to all kinds of wise or unwise, foolish ideas. So of course that's what's conditioning us, isn't it? And you look at someone, whether it's a very wise and peaceful monk like Lumpur Liam, or anyone, male or female, young or old in this world. I mean, you're looking, your eyes are just seeing a form, but your perceptions start coming up based on what you see and what's happened before in your life and what you remember. So one person sees a monk and is very happy. Maybe they see the robe and it immediately inspires faith. Maybe they, they see the, the peaceful manner of a monk, sort of tranquility and peace of that monk comes off from the image and so it arouses a lot of faith, happiness. But another person can look at a, a Buddhist monk and not understand what they are or dislike them. Maybe they from an, have faith in another religion or they look on them a bit as something alien because they have no experience. And so they can be have a very negative perception come up. Or maybe somebody who's seen too many gangster movies might <laughs> start looking at a monk and think they look like a gangster. Uh, I always remember the time my mum told me about a phone-in radio show in the UK where someone had phoned in. I wasn't there. I was in Thailand in the jungle, but she told me later she was listening to a, a BBC radio programme and someone phoned in saying they would discovered two or, or one species of animal that was totally new and there were two of them walking through the forest or moving through the forest they'd seen them in northern England and then they were trying to identify what kind of animal they were and they were describing them these sort of animals walking through the forest brown colored but with a whitish round head <laughs> and people were ringing up saying there's some kind of dinosaur prehistoric animal, some kind of escaped bear or something and in the end someone rang in and said ah, these are two Buddhist monks, they must be walking through the forest <laughs> took them a while to get there apparently so you see a Buddhist monk but how you perceive them will vary, won't it, depending on your attachments, your kilesa so you can even see a enlightened monk who's a blessing to the world but you can see them in the light of your own perception and misinterpret what you see or just look at it in a negative way perhaps. I know one monk who told me when he first became a monk he had a, his role model was you know he had an ideal in his mind that all monks should be totally compassionate, kind, peaceful in their look 
And then he saw a picture of the teacher Lumpur Man. And in those days there weren't many photographs like there are nowadays. And there was one kind of standard photograph of Lumpur Man standing in the forest. And he's considered to be a, an Arahant and he's like the father of our tradition. So he's a very strict but very wise, peaceful monk. Perfectly enlightened. But they saw Lumpur Man and they looked at his face and they felt his eyes look fierce. So for a few years they had this thought, and they said it was so fast, the perception of seeing Lumpur Man's eyes as fierce, kind of threatening almost. They couldn't stop themselves thinking like that. They also they were very wise monk as well, so they felt, well, this is just the way I look at the picture. I don't believe he was fierce, but they couldn't stop themselves having that reaction when seeing his eyes because his eyes were very intense, kind of perhaps reflecting his deep states of samadhi and insight and also a sense of detachment from the world. So that for a few years they had this sort of automatic reaction, his eyes are fierce or maybe too fierce. So just look, looking at this picture slightly critically, then he realized this is karma, negative karma. Um, because this is the wrong way to describe an arahant as fierce. And he actually found in his meditation there was a few blocks. He had some suffering, some problems coming up in his meditation. And eventually he attributed them to this negative karma he'd been making by having an incorrect perception towards Lumpur Man. So he corrected it and eventually it dropped away. He didn't see him as fierce anymore. He realized that was a delusion. And the karma faded and his meditation improved very well after that. So yes, you're right to bring it up, I think. If you have a negative per perception towards a, a good monk or to the Buddha or sometimes to Buddha statues, people have their resistance, their reaction. It can indeed be a strong kind of karma. The most likely sort of result would be that it will be negative mind states coming up can give rise to doubt, anguish, remorse as well. What happens outside with other people in the world, well that will all depend. Karma is quite difficult to explain. The Buddha said don't try and work it all out, it's too difficult. So whether you're reborn in a place based on the karma, karma you make, if you have a strange perception or a wrong perception about it, a monk or the Buddha, well, um, it might be hard to predict exactly how it manifests, whether you'll be reborn in some way, like seeing a monk as a gangster, whether you'll be reborn as a gangster, sounds a bit simplistic. But certainly there may be obstacles and negative experiences coming back to you f for holding on to that perception, if that's what you are clinging to. Um, I knew a Buddhist nun who had an experience the first year she was a nun. When once she, not long after she ordained as a Buddhist nun, her face swelled up with these massive boils and became a complete. The boils were so many and so large they completely closed her eyes. She couldn't see for a number of months. She just had to stay in a room, resting on a bed. People brought her her food. And there was intense burning sensation with these boils. She couldn't see, she couldn't function very well as a human being for a few months. And the doctors couldn't really explain where it came from. And they assumed it was some kind of allergic reaction, you know, like when you have a bee sting or you touch some plant or you have some food that you're allergic to, it could have been that. There may have been a more sort of normal explanation, but she had, during this period, she had a vision during her meditation of her holding a Buddha statue and because she disliked the look of the statue she, and she was very angry, maybe for other reasons as well, she was angry, she actually 
smashed the Buddha statue and the head broke off. That was what she understood to be in a past life. And then in this life she had this amazing reaction that seemed to come out of nowhere. But by the end of the range retreat it had faded and she was back to normal and carried on. But she said, oh, I'm never going to hate a Buddha statue again. I'll never do anything to a Buddha statue because she felt that was karma that came back to her very strongly. So sometimes strange things happen, you know, people, they say well, if, if you fall in love with a monk or a nun, that can be very heavy karma that leads to, that follows you for many lives. Or if you try to hurt a monk or a nun, who's somebody who's got sila, who's got virtue, because they have virtue, it's very heavy karma to try and hurt them or cause them suffering. So that tends to follow you maybe for many lifetimes. So there was one monk, in the time of the Buddha, a famous story, there was one monk who always appeared to have a lady, a young lady, next to him, wherever he was. If he was sitting in his hut, she seemed to be sitting near him. Other people would see this young lady sitting near him. Or if he's walking along the road on arms round into the village, they'd see a woman walking behind him. And he didn't. He was oblivious to this because there was no woman there. It was just an image that everyone would see, except for him. And he was always behind him, so he didn't really notice. But other people would become outraged and say, oh, "Why is this monk so walking along with a woman? Like you know, like it's his wife or his girlfriend?" And they'd see it in many occasions. And it started to cause a lot of gossip and rumours. And in the end, King, I think it was King Persenadi heard about this and he was had faith in the Buddha and he didn't want the Sangha reputation to be damaged. So he went to investigate himself because everyone said it's true. There's this woman living with the monk. It's, you know, it's a shameful thing, terrible thing. So Persenadi, the king, I guess in those days, kings, you know, they didn't have large numbers of bodyguards necessarily. They could also be fairly low key so he went to the monastery and he was sneaking around the monk's kuti peering in at the window to see is there a woman in there and he could see a woman sitting next to him so I go to one window and look and oh she's there and then he go to another window to double check yeah she's still there but then when he went into the kuti there was no one there no woman there was just the monk sitting there so he realized this is an image it must be some kind of karma and later on the Buddha explained to this monk, because this monk was having a lot of trouble, people wouldn't feed him and they'd chase him away and scold him, calling him a bad monk and he became very skinny and ill because he was not getting any care as a monk. It was just out of compassion for his other, his other friends would feed him. Um, so he was struggling. And the Buddha explained that this karma was many, many lifetimes before there had been a, a devata, a spirit living in a tree. And this monk had been a monk in that life as well and he'd had a friend and they're very close, close buddies. And they go everywhere together and they respected each other, practiced together, lived in the same monastery. So a very close friendship and this deva, devata in the tree was, saw this happening because devas can often see what humans are doing. And the devata were both jealous of this close friendship but also sceptical and wanted to see how close, how good the friendship was. So the devata devised a test of their friendship. So one day these two monks were walking through the forest. I think they were walking to see the Buddha, to go and hear the Buddha teach. But on the way, because they're going through the forest, they had to stop to go to the toilet. So one of them went to the toilet just in the bushes, the other one waited on the path. And the devata made themselves into the form of a young woman. And when the monk returned from the going to the toilet, 
the day that I walked behind him, adjusting clothes with just not many clothes on and just adjusting her clothes, a young woman, as if just been in the bushes with a monk. So it looked very uh, inappropriate, sordid. And so immediately his friend took offence and said, what have you been doing in the bushes? <laughs> You're a monk, you can't be in there with a girl. This is terrible. How could you do that, friend? You know, I've trusted you all these years. You, you, I always thought you were a good monk. And the, the monk said, what, what have I done? I haven't done anything. Because he didn't know what was going on. He didn't see this woman. He didn't, hadn't done anything. But the Devada was tricking his friend. And then other monks got to hear about this. And so again, the, man, the monk's reputation was ruined. All the Sangha were ready to sort of throw him out of the monastery and, and disown him because he it just seemed like he was a shameless monk sleeping with women and always having this woman walking behind him. So the Buddha had to explain, well, this is karma. It's not that there's a real woman. It's just an image generated by karma because this monk, sorry, yeah, said it a bit wrong, the monk in this previous life had been tricked by the Devata uh, and that karma had led to a dis his, being, his reputation being ruined and then he um, It affected the whole Sangha in that lifetime. So the karma that the Deva made, that later, later on the Devata was, um, came to ask forgiveness from the monk because really he hadn't been doing it seriously, it was just a kind of a prank or just testing out the friendship of these two monks. But actually the two monks after that, they never went back to being friends again, even though they realised it was just a Devata tricking them, it wasn't real, this woman coming out of the bushes with the monk. It was all a prank, but the friendship was destroyed. So the karma of destroying the friendship of these two monks and tricking everyone thinking that the, the monk had been in the bushes with a woman followed every life after that, followed the, uh, the devata. And then in this last life, after many lives and many stories apparently, in this last life, the devata is a monk but with this image of a woman following the karma of having created a woman's image to fool everyone in the original life. Um, so the Buddha explained what had happened and eventually this monk became enlightened through his practice hearing the Dhamma from the Buddha and when he became enlightened the image of the woman disappeared. That was the end of the karma. So that is one example the monk with the image of a woman following him all the time. So we should be careful the kind of comments and views we have, attitudes we have towards, particularly towards well-practiced monks, nuns, even lay men, lay women. You know, it can be very heavy karma if you think critically of them or have strange perceptions towards them. Another question, dear Lumpur, what is the Buddhist perspective on lucid dreaming? <laughs> well, they say arahants don't dream, so I guess that puts a one perspective, gives you one perspective. You know, it's not in, in the end, it's not something very that important and that special. The pure mind actually stops dreaming. But the Buddha and other teachers mention that dreams, lucid sort of dreams, come from a number of causes. Probably the most common one is physiological to do with, often to do with food. <laughs> Eating too much gives you dreams. Uh, I seem to remember my granny telling me that. Don't eat too much rich food, you'll have bad dreams. Perhaps I thought it was just a, a, a technique of an adult to get me to not eat certain things or eat too much, but it seems to be true. You eat too much food in amount or maybe too much of the wrong kind of food, 
rich food or certain spicy food or something, often that sets you off. Some people get wind, gas, affects the body and often that can give uh, be a cause for dreams, they say. So physical causes, the body, eating too much, but sometimes illness also can make you dream a lot. And a lot of people complain when they're ill with flu or COVID or other serious illnesses that weaken the body, they dream a lot. People in hospital often say they dream a lot and often very kind of confused dreams. So often physical causes are the cause of dreams. That's one that the Buddha mentioned. Another would be just the ordinary anxieties and confusion of the mind, what you might call the five hindrances, which we are always dealing with in meditation. Unfinished business comes up in your subconscious as you're falling asleep. Especially you'll notice if you've had a lot of worries or anger or desire just before you fall asleep. So if you haven't been meditating, you're not very mindful, you have certain emotions, anxiety coming up before you go to sleep. Well, as you fall asleep, you may have dreams about it or stimulated by it or when you wake up in the morning or whenever you wake up or even you don't sleep very well, so you keep waking up because of your anxiety. So it's often unfinished business, attachments, confusion, anxiety, worry, fears coming up. Anger can also do it, so you've got strong anger over a situation that's arisen in your day and it can keep you awake at night and it can give you dreams. Lust as well, you have strong lust, so you have dreams based on that. So these are all the five hindrances, they'll stimulate dreams as your mind is moving from a normal state of mind towards deep sleep. There's this half, half awake consciousness, that's where you might get dreams. Another kind of dream the Buddha talked about is premonitions and particularly warnings. So you have a dream that warns you about an approaching problem or danger to do with other people or just in your life. And even in the time of the Buddha, kings and other people would have dreams and they go to the Buddha to ask him to explain this. And he, point out what what the warning is about. Uh, sometimes, you know, yeah, it, it just tends to be warnings, premonitions about upcoming events, but often in a sense of a, something that's going to be dangerous to, to warn you to be careful or change a plan maybe. The other kind of premonition, it tends to be the more positive one. Dreams preceding good events based on your karma, maybe something good is going to happen and you get a premonition of that. So again, the Buddha himself said he, he himself had premonitions before his enlightenment. There's the famous five dreams, if I remember, that he had before he got enlightened, that just saying what's coming. So he had one, um, he was lying down and kusa grass, this kind of thick, grass that grows in the jungle in India was growing out of his belly and went right up to the sky and his interpretation of that was that the grass is rooted in the earth but it's also reaching right up to the sky going way up into the heaven realms as it was so it's saying he's going to become an enlightened teacher and teach both the ordinary people even the ones way down you know people who are poor or close to the earth and devas and brahmas way up in the stratosphere or the heaven realms. It's going to teach them all. It's going to be a teacher of, of every kind of being. Um, or the other one was the f one he was lying down and his head was lying on the Himalayas. You know, it must have had a huge body in this dream. His head is on the Himalayas as a pillow and his feet stretching right down to the oceans. So again, it's a premonition of him going to become an enlightened teacher that has a dramatic, um, um, big influence in the population of the world uh, you know, over a large area. There's a few more, you can read about it, Google it. But premonitions of good events 
good things that may happen. And many meditators will have this sometimes to let them know something good is going to happen. Um, what one, sometimes monks in this monastery have had a, a dream before uh, a very good teacher has come to visit. They'll see them in their dream first. It's quite common. Lay people as well, of course, not just monks. Um, the last kind of dream may be stimulated by something external. So they usually say devatas, spiritual beings, particularly ones with a lot of merit, a lot of barami, can prompt a dream in someone's mind through their metta, spreading metta, say, to influencing that person to help them have a dream that maybe is meaningful, significant. Um, even a you know a teacher spreading metta can give you a good dream. You call that maybe call that a nimitta. But in, as you're waking up or falling asleep, you might have a very lucid dream that's very meaningful, um, and it's stimulated from a teacher spreading their jitta, their mind to you, or it could be from a deva. So. The Buddha talked about a number of different causes for dreams. Um, so you, something to just observe through your practice. But of course all dreams arise, pass away. You can also contemplate them as just impermanent. And they may come true and maybe not. I wouldn't believe them 100%, maybe 99%. If it's a lucid dream, it may seem to be telling you something, a premonition. I'd give it 99%, but never 100%. Just leave a little bit of space for the uncertainty of life. Mm -hmm. Next question. Lumpur, oh dear Ajahn Karyanu, the Venerable Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Anand say that we must abandon our likes and our dislikes. Why is that? <laughs> what is wrong with knowing uh, a pleasant feeling or unpleasant feeling, but also liking, having liking based on it, or liking without grasping or craving or hating. For example, nice food, scenery. Is it because of the identification I like? Yeah, well, you've sort of got it in your question, I think. It's the grasping and the craving is the problem. And most monks will talk about liking and disliking, wanting, not wanting, as grasping or craving, or this word dana. Um, like you say, you know, the world is full of all kinds of experiences, and some are pleasant, some are unpleasant. They are just what they are. So, food, some food will agree with you, it suits your taste buds and your body and your. Uh, character so it will come across as pleasant tasting to you or some food may come across as unpleasant that is just what it is and the encouragement of the Buddha is to be mindful of the tasting and to know the quality of the food it may be nice smelling nice tasting to you or not pleasant to you same with smells same with sights sounds Establish mindfulness and there is just seeing, there's just tasting, there's just hearing without going into craving. But that's very hard to do at first, you have to practice. That's why you practice a lot of mindfulness and then reflect on the impermanence, the unsatisfactoriness and the not-self of sense objects. So you're diminishing the amount of craving and attachment that arises based on sense contact. So the, the enlightened ones, they still eat food and it will taste agreeable to them, it will be pleasant to them or unpleasant. It's just they don't create any uh, craving or attachment out of that experience because they've contemplated enough, established enough mindfulness that they're just seeing, just tasting, just smelling. The mind doesn't go to craving. So sometimes people misunderstand. They think, oh, Buddhism's against all 
beauty and all pleasurable experiences and just wants you to be kind of numb <laughs> or kind of cold to the world. It's not that. You still know what is pleasant or unpleasant. It's the craving that you're removing because craving leads to suffering. Why is that? Well, if you keep getting caught into liking, you become addicted to things and you keep dreaming about them and wanting them. And sometimes that leads you into very unskillful behavior as well. You know, the more craving you have, often the more agitated you are and you may do things to get the thing that you're craving. Um, it's accompanied by greed and often it also stimulates a lot of anguish when you don't get the thing you want or you can't get it or you've had it and then you've lost it and you often go to anguish or disappointment, don't you? So liking and disliking or craving leads on to suffering if it's not addressed with mindfulness and insight. So a large part of our meditation practice is based around this, getting to establish mindfulness and to know, first of all, just to know the mind and what's going on but then to recognize the process, how suffering arises. If you're mindful, truly mindful, maybe the liking or the disliking arises, you just know it. There's liking, this is something that agrees with me. But then you drop it, you let it go. Or you reflect more deeply, oh, this thing I like, how permanent is it? How good is it? What disadvantages are there to liking this thing. One thing, if it doesn't last, is, well, I'll become disappointed when it part, I separate from the thing I like. You know, we miss things, don't we? We crave things, we miss things, we want things. This is the drawback of following craving. It doesn't make us peaceful and content as human beings. So we're always going into either liking or disliking of things. We're learning about that to try and free the mind from craving and attachment. But it doesn't mean to say it will change the world. There'll still be pleasant sense objects and unpleasant sense objects coming our way. The most important thing though is how do you respond to them? How do you treat them with your mind? And that's a large part of our practice. In the first instance, the Buddha said, practice restraint, restraint sense restraint. So if you know there's something that is very tempting to you, you love this, you know, with food, say. <laughs> There's a kind of food you love and you become obsessed with it and addicted to it and overindulge in it maybe. Well, maybe we become more restrained around it, very careful around that particular kind of food because you know you have a weakness. And that applies to all kinds of sense experiences. The aim is you get to the point when you're, you know, the mind of the Arahant has gone beyond liking and disliking, is free. You're not enslaved to kilesa or wanting, not wanting, liking, disliking. The mind is free, it's liberated. Which you would have to say is a better state to be in than to always be chasing our likes and our dislikes. Last question. Lumpur, in the time of the Buddha, what happened to the Buddha's wife, Yasodhara, after the Buddha left home to practice as a monk? Hmm. Um, well, Yasodhara, yep, the Buddha's wife, often in Thailand they use the more colloquial term or nickname, Bim Bimba. Bimba. She had a few names. But she was the wife of the Buddha. And the, the commentaries say she had been the Buddha's wife for many, many lifetimes. And she'd made a, a determination to follow the Buddha for hundreds and thousands and who knows, countless lifetimes to support him in his practice and follow him as a student of the Buddha. So in many walks of life, not always, uh, he obviously he hadn't been a Buddha yet in his previous lives, but always following him, so quite often being his wife in previous lives. And she gave birth to their son, Rahula. Um, they say after the Buddha left home 
to go out into the forest to practice. You know, he spent the first five years, uh, six years practicing the ascetic practices and then finally had a few realizations and became enlightened under the Bodhi tree. So all that period, Bimba was still in the palace, but obviously everything had changed. Her husband, the prince, the future king had gone. So she kind of lost a bit of status, they say, as you would expect. So one thing she had to endure was other princes and noblemen coming to try and get her, <laughs> caught her, take her away for themselves. Um, so she resisted that. She actually started to practice celibacy. And she knew exactly what her husband was up to. She knew the Buddha had gone away to practice for enlightenment. And that was probably an innate kind of insight she'd had for many, many lifetimes. So she started practicing a spiritual life. She kept celibate. She knew her husband was just sleeping on the floor on a mat. So she started sleeping on the floor on a mat, even though she's a wealthy, well-to-do well lady. Uh, she started eating one meal a day in a single vessel, which you could imagine in a palace would be very rare. Everyone in a palace has a palatial style meal with lots of different kinds of plates and cutlery and different kinds of foods. And she started to eat more like an ascetic in one dish, they say, on one time as well. So forgoing the sort of parties and the dinner parties and all of that. So she basically started to live more like a nun. She still looked after uh, the son, but she uh, lived very, a very ascetic life, always thinking of the Buddha. She never forgot the Buddha, they say, until the Buddha's finally enlightened. And then eventually he came back. His father, the king, wanted to see him, so he kept sending messengers inviting the Buddha back because he'd heard he's enlightened now. And he's, these messengers kept meeting the Buddha, becoming <laughs> enlightened, becoming monks, so they couldn't bring him back because they started to become students of the Buddha, living with him as monks. So I think they say ten messengers when finally the Buddha thought, thought, thought it was the right time to go back to the palace. So he went back to the palace and his wife, perhaps being his wife, didn't rush out to meet him because he's now an enlightened teacher, a celibate monk, and she's celibate too. She sent the son out. So there's this famous uh, moment when the young Rahula goes out and said, I'm here to claim my inheritance from the Buddha, but it's not a material inheritance of wealth, it's the inheritance of the Dhamma. He wants to hear the Dhamma, so he quickly becomes a novice monk. And the Buddha teaches uh, Suddhodana, the king, and eventually gets him to be an arahant. And when he meets his wife, he talked a bit about past lives and how she had followed him for many lives. And gave, uh, talked about what we, call the, what, what we now call the Jataka stories. He told one Jataka story about how they had fallen in love in the forests of the Himalayas, but then disaster struck when a king or a, the governor of the city came hunting in the forest. The Bodhisattva and his wife didn't hunt. I guess they practiced compassion and sila, but the governor of the town would love to come out hunting and he shot the Buddha and the Buddha was dying. Well, he's a Bodhisattva, sorry, he's not yet a Buddha. The Bodhisattva is dying. His wife is caring for him, praying or meditating and using her strength of mind to try and save him and wishing for him to be saved. And then because she makes this solemn vow, he's got to be saved. Indra, Lord of the Gods, comes down and saves the Buddha at the last moment. So the Buddha survives and there, you know, it's the description of their love and her role, supportive role with the Buddha, the Buddha to be. And of course, the bad guy is Devadatta, the governor of the king, the governor of the city, who came out and sh shot 
the Buddha was Devadatta, who in this last life as the Buddha tried to kill him. So that's a big part of his return to the palace, teaching the father, teaching his wife, and teaching his wife about this role she had kind of performed for many lifetimes. She became a Sotapanna, first uh, level of enlightenment. Later she was to become fully enlightened before she died. And she died two years, I think, before the Buddha. She was uh, about 78. So, But before that, she had become a Sotapanna. Her son has ordained, so he's joined the Sangha. So she eventually joins the Sangha of Bhikkhunis following her, the Buddha's stepmother, Maha Pachapati. Um, so Yasodhara also becomes a Bhikkhuni and practices, because that's what she sort of already intent on for many lifetimes, they say. She's going to become a practitioner, practice for Nibbana. And when she attains enlightenment, becomes Arahant, she gains what they call Maha Abhinya. She was foremost in psychic ability. She could read people's minds, she could move through the air, she could do all kinds of psychic feats um, because she had the greatest ability with Abhinya. Um, So she became an Arahant with these great abilities and then lived and helped to teach other nuns for about 40 years or so, just and died a couple of years before the Buddha died. So she... uh, You don't hear a lot about her in suttas or commentaries, but the story is there. So she did a lot of good for Buddhism in her lifetime as a nun, and she had great psychic ability. They say she got all these abhinya, the psychic powers, from all the good karma, the merit she made following the bodhisattva for, for so many lifetimes. She had to endure so many hardships, sacrifice so much, So one of the hardships in this final life was she would go around barefoot because she was an ascetic. This was when she was still in the palace before she became a nun. She would walk around barefoot, which I guess, again, the princess or the the wife of the future king wouldn't normally do that, but she did. She gave up shoes. So her feet were always, because they're very soft, they're always cut open, bloody and they say, oh, this is an example of her great faith in the Bodhisattva, her great determination in her practice. And there's many other things that people found inspiring at that time because she shunned her wealth and privilege and all the sort of comfort she had for the spiritual life. So they say, Yasodhara is the real thing. <laughs> she... Uh, Great sacrifice, great determination, followed the Buddha and ultimately became an Arahant and with great psychic powers as well. Uh, So that's what happened to the Buddha's wife. The Buddha's son, we'll leave that for another question, another day maybe. It's another story.